All of our lives, God has been so good. So, so good. That song just touches my heart every time because I realize uh, I've really had nothing to do with my life. I look back over it, maybe you can do the same, and you wonder, why did I do that? Why did I go there? Why was I a part of that? Why did I have that opportunity? Why did I have that struggle? Why did I go through that problem? Why am I even here in this room today? And when you really stop and think, we're not in control of much of anything. God is leading and directing it's just amazing. It's been consuming my mind the last few weeks uh, of how God has just led and, and blessed and directed when I didn't have any idea what was going on. And I think maybe you can experience that also. Uh, God has been so, so good. And so today we rise up and we bless him and we, we thank him for how good he has been. And we want to know how to serve him better and how to let our lives count to the fullest for his glory. So that's why for this month of October, we've been studying about spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts are uh, an ability that the Spirit gives us when we come to know Jesus Christ as our Savior. And we've been wanting to learn, what does the Bible say about that? What is my gift? What is my part in the body of Christ? So we've learned uh, several things. We've learned that there are three kinds of gifts. There's what are called motivational gifts. I'm sorry, manifest manifestation gifts. These are sign gifts. They're given by the Spirit. They were given to the apostles and the disciples to, to be able to do things that, that gave authority to the Word that they were speaking, the Word of God. They didn't have Bibles back in that day. They didn't have a lot of the tools that we have today. And so those manifestation or sign gifts were given to validate what the apostles, what the disciples were saying. And then Christ gave to his church uh, ministry gifts, and these are given to the people who will lead and teach and train the church like apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Those were the gifts that Christ gave to his church. And then God gave to his people motivational gifts. And I believe because of Romans chapter uh, 12 and what it teaches us in verses 8 and 9, I believe that God has given seven basic different gifts to his body. Now, there's a lot of outflow of these gifts, but they are the gifts of prophecy, serving, teaching, exhortation, giving, leading, and mercy. And I believe that each of us here in this room who know Christ as our Savior, we each have a primary motivation. We may have a secondary one also. But there's some primary gifting that motivates us. When we are a part of that in the work of God, it just works well and it blesses other people because all of these gifts are not given to bless us personally. They're given to be used through our lives to bless others. And when we give our gifts away in the name of Christ to others, then we get blessed. It's a wonderful way that God works in all of that. And so we've learned every believer has a primary and a secondary gift, perhaps, and it motivates us. We've learned how to discover our gifts, and now I hope a lot of you have known your gift after last week and how Brandon led us through that. And then we have learned that we are to develop and use our giftedness. And so today I want to just kind of finalize some teachings that I think will really help make all of this become very, very clear. Um, let me show you a diagram that uh, kind of help us realize how this works. Uh, the gifts, all of them have a definition. We've studied this. And then all of them meet a certain need. The prophet meets a spiritual need. The server meets a practical need. And then this is what comes out of that. Now, I wanted to see that chart because that, that, when that chart is all working, when those gifts are all functioning, when those needs are all being met, man, the church becomes unstoppable because its people are doing what we've been put in this place, in our place to do. We are letting the gift flow from us. And that's when the gates of hell can't even prevail against the church. And so we want to kind of 
capsulize all of this today and I hope make it very, very understandable and applicable. Let's pray and ask God to do that. Father, our hearts are humbled. I just thank you for every person in this room today. I thank you for bringing us together exactly as you have. And I thank you for the way that all of us who are followers of you have, have an unbelievable gift inside of us. And, and our prayer is, oh God, let that gift flow. Let that gift grow. Let that gift, if it's developable, let it be developed and used fully in your kingdom to, to cause your will to be done and your kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven. So today we ask that you'll speak to us, Holy Spirit. I have nothing to say. You alone have the words of truth and the words of life. So speak that truth and help us to uh, just rejoice in who we are in Christ. We love you. Thank you for your uh, goodness that just runs after us all the time. May we never uh, miss out on what you want to do through us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, after all we've learned, Paul comes uh, to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and he does a very, very interesting thing. To me, this is, it's kind of humorous scripture. I think there's a lot of uh, humor in the Bible, but this is one that I think is very humorous when you really stop and think of how Paul was trying to help uh, the people in Corinth to understand you are unstoppable. You, you've got so much ability, so much power, so much potential. You're unstoppable. So here's how he says it. It's a fairly long portion of scripture, but I think you'll uh, appreciate it very much. He said, the human body has many parts, but the many parts make up one whole body. So you know, uh, you look at yourself, you just got parts and parts. We're just parts and parts, okay? So he says, so it is with the body of Christ. The body of Christ is made up of parts and parts and parts. Some of us are Jews, some of us are Gentiles, some of us are slaves, and some are free. But we have all been baptized into one body by one spirit, and we share, we all share the same spirit. Okay? It's that spirit that is working in us. Now he works the gift out through us. So he goes on and says, Yes, the body has many different parts, not just one part. If the foot says, I am not a part of the body because I am not a hand, that does not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear says, I am not a part of the body because I am not an eye, would that make it any less a part of the body? And then he makes, a, I think, a humorous statement. He says, well, think about it. If the whole body were an eye, how would you hear? Okay. Or if your whole body were an ear, how would you smell anything? Ears don't smell usually. Okay. Uh, you know, they just don't. So if you're, if, if you're just an ear, then how can you smell the aroma of that good food that you want to, to eat? Okay. He goes on and he says, but our bodies have many parts and God has put each part just where he wants it. Cool statement. You know, if your nose were your foot, you wouldn't get very far, okay? So he says, God's put every part just where he wants it. How strange a body would be if it had only one part. Yes, there are many parts, but only one body. The eye can never say to the hand, I don't need you. The head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. In fact, some parts of the body that seem weakest and least important are actually the most necessary. And the parts we regard as less honorable are those we clothe with the greatest care. So he said, we carefully protect those parts that should not be seen, while the more honorable parts do not require this special care. Okay? Uh, one of the uglier parts of our body is our feet. Okay? Uh, some of our feet, your, mine especially, okay? Our feet are not pretty. They're utility instruments, okay? And so we, we put nice, pretty, oh man, you got beautiful shoes on today. Oh man, you know? Because we cover them because they're not that desirable, 
All right? So he says, so God has put the body together such that extra honor and care are given to those parts that have less dignity. This makes for harmony among the members so that all the members care for each other. It's a very important statement. We are all a part of the body. I don't know if you're an ear or a hand or a foot or a toe, but we're all a part of the body. We each have our function in the body. That's where the giftedness comes in. We each have our part to perform. And when everybody is performing their part well, man, it works very, very fine. So he says, if one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. Have you ever smashed your finger with a hammer? Okay. Do you notice what happens when you smash your finger with a hammer? All you're hurting is this right here. But what happens? Your whole body starts doing stuff, you know? You scream and you yell and you say things that you might not normally say. Okay? And your feet start moving and your body shivers and, and you're hurting. So he says, if one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. That's where we get the idea. If someone's weeping, we weep with them. But then he says, if, if, uh, he says uh, and if one part is honored, all the parts are glad. That's where we rejoice with those who rejoice. Man, when everything's feeling good, everybody's in your body. Every part's happy. All of you together are Christ's body, and each of you is a part of it. So what he's trying to say is, folks, we're in this together. We don't do this by ourselves. The church will never be effective to the extent that the people are not fulfilling their part in the body. And that's the reason we've taken these four weeks is to try to help you really understand what your giftedness is so that you can know better how to let that gift flow and fulfill your part so that the body is complete and whole and effective. Each of us are necessary to the functioning of the body and the accomplishment of the mission of the church. Now, as we identify our part, Paul warns us about something in Romans because he says there's a human tendency to think maybe that your part is better than someone else's part or that your part is just doesn't count with someone else's part. And he says, I don't want you to think that way. Whatever God's given you, that's your gift. That's your Part. That's your opportunity to most fully serve and bless God. So in Romans chapter 12, verses 3 through 6, Paul warns the church about this. He says, Because of the privilege and authority God has given me, I give each of you this warning. Don't think you are better than you really are. You see, we've done something dumb in the church. We've elevated the clergy up to this point, and then the laity's down here somewhere. That's a hangover from Catholicism. That's not biblical. The clergy's no better than the laity, and the laity's no better than the clergy. We're all just fulfilling our part, whatever it is that God's called us to do, whatever God's gifted us to do. And if we do it together, and we realize no one's better than anybody else, no one's higher in the on the, the totem pole than anybody else, then we realize we're in this together. We're going we're gonna to love and serve each other and bless each other so that the church accomplishes its purpose. So he says, don't think you're better than you really are. And then he says, and the corollary would be, don't think less of yourself either. He says, but be honest in your evaluation of yourselves. Measuring yourselves by the faith God has given us. Whatever your gift is, whatever your ability is, whatever your part is, love it and use it and let it be fruitful for the kingdom of God. And then he says, just as our bodies have many parts and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. 
We are many parts of one body, and we all belong to each other. I love that. We're many parts, but we all belong. This is many parts. You are many parts, but it all belongs. It's my body. It's one thing that gets the job done. And then he closes by saying, we all belong to each other in his grace. God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. So humility is a very important part of letting our giftedness flow. We each have our responsible roles to perform, discover it, perform it well as one piece, one part of the total picture. We are all to be servant leaders in our giftedness. I am to be a servant leader to you. You are to be a servant leader to me. We are to be servant leaders to each other. And when we have that kind of potential, man, we blossom into all that God planned for our lives. Now, I want to close off this morning by showing you four illustrations. They've been very, very interesting to me. Uh, if they're not interesting to you, I wish you'd still act interested, okay? Fake it a little, okay? Uh, but they're very, very interesting because they help us see how these gifts all work together. So let's first of all, in the first illustration, suppose that um, we saw a woman with her arms full of papers and she's walking across our parking lot and she stumbles and she drops all those papers all over the place. How would the seven different gifts and motivations that we've been looking at, how would they respond? Let me show you an illustration of that. The prophet would say, this is an opportunity to tell her that God loves her and this is a great church. He wants to get truth out there, okay? All right. The server would say, oh, she's obviously in need of practical help, and they would run to her, okay? The teacher would say, the Bible teaches that we are to be a servant to each other, so let's help her. The exhorter would say, here's a great opportunity to meet someone and encourage her to get involved in a small group. <laughs> Trying to, exhorters always like to work on the future. My personal gift is exhortation, and, and uh, that's why you hear me often say, when you walk through the door, I don't care what your past is, because all we can do with the past is either have it forgiven, and then the second thing is to learn from it so we don't repeat it. Can't do anything about the past. It's past, but I care about today and on. That's what exhorters do. Okay. Giver would say, I can give my time and effort to someone in need. The leader would say, honey, why don't you get the car while I help this lady so we won't be late for our meeting? They delegate. See, they see the big picture. Okay. And then the mercy extender would say, oh, I hope she's not embarrassed. I can identify. I can help her. And they come and put their arm around her and, and just love her, you know. That's how those gifts, but you see, when all of those gifts are working together, it really helps that lady trying to pick up her mess. All right. Let me give you a second illustration. Uh, if seven men are representing uh, each of the spiritual gifts met to organize an ideal church, here is what each of them would emphasize, probably, okay? And the prophet would say, I want there to be well-prepared sermons exposing sin, warning of judgment to come, and proclaiming righteousness. Okay? Because prophets are proclaimers of truth. There's black and white. It's got to be true. Got to speak the truth. The second is a servant. The servant would say, would offer practical assistance to each member of the church to encourage him and to help him fulfill his responsibilities. All right? Then the teacher would have, we've got to have a church where there's in-depth Bible studies with special emphasis on the precise meaning of the Greek words, and I want those Greek words up on the screen every Sunday, okay? Because they are concerned about knowing the truth and, and understanding and being sure it's rightly taught. Then the next one is the exhorter, okay? And the exhorter would offer personal counseling 
and encouragement. They'd say, we want to have a counseling center in our church where people can come and we'll have people on our staff who can really help them. Okay? Then the giver would say, we want to have a church where there are generous programs of financial assistance to missionaries, to church members, and to other ministries. Because, and, and I'll help to give to make that happen. The administrator would say, we've got to have a church that's smooth running in its organization so that every phase will be carried out decently and in order. And the mercy person would say, no, no, no. Here's what we need for this church. We need to have a special outreach and concern for the precise and varying feelings of individuals with a readiness to meet their needs. Now, you see how all of those different motivations are there. They're all excellent. They're all needed. And when they all work together, the whole thing works unbelievably well. Let me show you one, two more illustrations, okay? If each of the seven gifts <coughs> excuse me, were represented in a family and someone just dropped the dessert on the floor, here is what uh, each one of them might say, okay? Desserts on the floor. The prophet would come in and say, that's what happens when you're not careful. Okay? Now, the motivation of the prophet is to correct that, that thing so you don't spill another dessert. How many parents have ever said that to, to their kids, okay? A servant would come and say, oh, oh, no, no, let me help you clean it up. And the motivation is to fulfill a need, the teacher would say, now, the reason that fell is that it was too heavy on one side. Okay, I got it figured out. I researched in Google, and <laughs> that thing was just, you didn't have it set in just right. The motivation is to just discover why it happened. They want to study to find out why that happened. The exhorter will say, next time, let's serve the dessert with the meal. And the motivation is to correct the future. Okay. The giver would say, I'll be happy to buy a new dessert. Don't worry about it. Okay? And the motivation is to give to a tangible need. The administrator would say, Jim, would you get the mop? Sue, please help pick it up. Mary, help me fix some more of the dessert. Okay? See? <laughs> the motivation is to achieve the immediate goal of the group. Let's just, you know, get that taken. The mercy person would say, oh, don't feel badly. It could happen to anyone. I've spilled 17 desserts. <laughs> Motivation is to relieve embarrassment. Let me show you one more illustration. And this one is, uh, if each of us, uh, of the seven gifts, if each of the gi seven gifts visited someone in the hospital, okay, here's what they might say. The prophet would say, what is God trying to say to you through this illness? Is there some area of sin you haven't confessed yet? The servant would say, oh, here's a little gift. Now, I brought you, I brought in your mail, I fed your dog, I watered your plants, and I washed your dishes. The teacher would say, I did some research on your illness, and I believe I can explain what's happening. You're dying. You know? <laughs> <laughs> The exhorter would come along and say, how can we use what you're learning here to help others in the future? The giver would say, do you have insurance to cover this illness? If you don't now, I, I want you to know, we'll take care of it somehow. We'll get this figured out. The administrator would say, oh, don't worry about a thing. I've assigned your job to four others in the office. It's all taken care of. And the mercy person would say, I can't begin to tell you how I felt when I learned you were so sick. How do you feel now? I'm here for you. And those are the people that come into the hospital room, and it's like Jesus is walking into the room, you know, because they're loved, they're, they're cared for. They're, there's empathy. I feel with you. Now, I hope those illustrations give you a, a, an idea of how when all the parts of the body, because you need every one of them, every one of them, when all the parts are working together, we're unstoppable. Whatever the need is, it can be met because we've got the gift, we've got the motivation, we've got the ability to together 
as one to get the job done. So what's so wonderful about spiritual gifts is this. When they work together as God intended and as God gifted, his will and plan get accomplished. And that's the reason we, we say to you, uh, if you do not know how to utilize your gift in and through this local church, please let us know. If you're not sure what your gift is, we'd love to have a coffee with you or a uh, Coke or whatever you want. And, uh, or lunch, and, and for us to sit down and really think through how God's working in your life. Because what our desire is, is to see this body just more and more and more become people who are involved daily, realizing, I am a Christian. I am a follower of Christ. I am gifted by God. How can I serve him at work, at home, at play, in my neighborhood, on my sports team, wherever it may be? How can I be serving the Lord with my giftedness? The Apostle Paul knew what would happen if we are faithful to God's call and gifting in our lives. And just before I read this, I want to reemphasize, if there's any way we can help you grow in that area, that's why we're here. And, and, and all of us in our church are busy with our lives, but we stop our busyness when we each have a need. And so if you, if you want to get together and work on that, that would be a joy because I think we could be a blessing to each other. So the Apostle Paul, he said, when everything is working well, there's an end result that happens in your life. And so over in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8, notice what it says. As for me, he said, my life has already been poured out as an offering to God. What Paul was really saying, and he wasn't bragging. I love the Apostle Paul because he's honest about things. He doesn't brag. He, he just states things the way it is. And when he messes up, he is very open about his mess up. But when he's successful, he's very open about his success. So he said, as for me, my life has already been poured out. I'm, I'm about ready to die, he said. The time of my death is near. I have fought the good fight. In other words... I think I've pretty much done what God put me here to do. I have finished the race, and I have remained faithful. Boy, wouldn't it be cool if you and I could come to the end of our life and make that kind of statement? And God says you can. If you'll just let me flow through your life and use you. Because he says, I'm up to stuff, and you don't even know what I'm doing. You don't have any idea how I want to use you this week in someone else's life. I've already laid the foundation for it. You're going to walk into an, a divine appointment opportunity, and, and I can use your gift. I can use your life. I can use my love and truth through you in that person's life like you can't believe. See, if we live our lives that way, it makes every day exciting. God, what are you going to do today? How are you going to use me today? What doors are you going to open for me today? It's a fun way to live our life. Paul said, I live my life that way. And then he said, because of that, a prize awaits me. He said, I know I've got a prize. And, and some people don't like to talk about rewards in heaven. I want you to know the Lord talked about them all the time. And he said, if you are found faithful down here doing what I've asked you and commissioned you to do, and he says, I've got stuff waiting for you in the future that you can't believe. He calls them rewards. I've got stuff waiting for you. And Paul said, uh, he said, there's a prize waiting for me. I know there is because I obeyed what God asked of me. He said, there's the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge will give to me on the day of his return. And then he adds this, and it's so cool. He says, I want you to know the prize isn't just for me. It's, I'm not just talking about me here, but it's for all who eagerly look forward to his appearing. And the way you eagerly look forward to his appearing is by doing faithfully what he's asked you to do here until he comes again, or until this life ends on this earth and we're with him forever in heaven. He says, be found faithful. Now, I want to show you what that prize ultimately is. There, there's all talks about rewards in heaven and different kinds of rewards. But I think Matthew put it so powerfully in chapter 25, verse 23. He said, 
There's going to be a time when the master's going to say something to those who've been found faithful to him. Well done. Now, if there's anything you want to hear from God when you see him face to face, hey, my son, my daughter, you did good. Well done. My good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in handling this small amount. So, so the teaching of the Bible is when we do what God asks us to do today, he can increase the opportunities for tomorrow. You've been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I will give you more responsibilities. And the picture is that there's going to be a whole other life that we live in eternity where we will have opportunities to serve God and others. I don't fully understand it because it's almost like a mystery. But I know that I would just love to hear him say that to me. And I would just love to hear him say that to you. Because there'd be nothing better that our Lord could say to us, except welcome to my kingdom and my heaven, than that kind of statement. You did good. You did what I asked you to do. Now, enter in. Man, I got stuff for you you never dreamed of. I hope you'll take seriously this whole concept of the fact that you are gifted. And whatever your motivation is, your secondary kind of thing that you do, whatever thought that is or they are, let God just flow through them. Don't, don't hide them under a bushel and a basket and pretend they're not there. They're to, be, they're to be flowing out of you and blossoming out of you and developing out of you for the glory of God and for the blessing of everyone that God brings into your life. Let's pray. Father, our hearts are so full of Praise to you for how good you've been to us. Your goodness is following us every day. And I just thank you for the potential of the people in this room. You have uh, created us in your image, which means we got unbelievable potential. Even though we sinned against you, yet Christ living in us just opens up all kinds of new opportunities. And we have a gift. For everyone who knows you, we have a gift. Oh God, I pray that you will help us to utilize that gift fully for you. Thank you for the potential of this church. Help us to say, we're going to do what you've asked us to do, Lord. And may we hear your well done. And with our heads still bowed and our eyes closed, I just want to say to you, if you're here today and You've heard all this talk about stuff for Christians. But down deep in your heart, you have to say, you know, I'm not sure I have any kind of relationship with Jesus Christ or with God, my Father. I'm not sure that I have been forgiven of my sinfulness. I'm not sure that when this life is over, I'll be with God in heaven. I want you to know, friend, Jesus has uh, made the way he is the way, and he did everything that could be done to make a way of forgiveness for your sin and salvation and a hope for eternal life starting right here on earth and then lasting forever. He did it all when he died on the cross for us, when he gave his life and when he shed his blood and paid the penalty for our sinfulness. He says, now, anyone who will believe that I am the Son of God and anyone who will call upon me and ask me to forgive them of their sin with a repentant, broken heart over their sinfulness and a desire to turn from that, anyone who asks me to forgive them of their sin in that attitude, I will not only forgive them of their sin and become their Savior, but I will live in their life through my Spirit and I will help them to know how to live their life for me the rest of their days. If that's the desire of your heart today, I would encourage you, please don't delay in humbling yourself before the Lord 
and admitting, I am a sinner and I need forgiveness for my sinfulness. And really all you have to do is say that to the Lord from a humble, broken heart. And he will hear. He says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ shall be saved. He says that he commended his love toward us. He gave his love toward us in that Christ died for us and paid the penalty. So if you want to ask Christ to be your Savior, all you have to do right now is just pray a prayer to him from your heart that is sincere. Acknowledge your sin. Tell him you believe in him. Ask him to forgive you and to lead your life. Thank you, Father, for all that you've done for us. We love you. And we ask that you will use our lives for your glory this new week of life that we have ahead of us, we pray. And as we again pray for ourselves, we pray for this world. So many countries today with war and rumors of war and so much fear, so much ignorance of your word. Oh God, may you cause your kingdom to come your will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we'll praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.